in the master, the ROMs go here. You've got the whole family of BBC micros with just one ROM. Yeah, stay classy. That might just about fit in there. So we will put a dose of hot snot just around the back here, just for extra sort of reinforcement. Oh, it's 3.5. We have 3.2. We have 2.0. And we have 1.2. Now there's still work to be done with this MMFS ROM so we can start using micro SD cards like this one we prepared earlier as storage for this Master 128. If you're wondering what that noise is, that's the printer. So in order to install one of these in a Master, a little bit more complicated than installing it in a Model B as I mentioned earlier. It's all down to the way that these slots are operating and these also act as sideways RAM for the master, I believe. Sideways RAM, yeah, they can act as sideways RAM. So it's a matter of making sure that the jumpers are correct and that the correct ROMs are in the correct slots. So with a master, the OS ROM always needs to be in the top slot, which is where multi-OS is. The second ROM to be installed goes in the third slot. So if you've only got two ROMs, this slot here, which you can't see because the multi-OS is hiding it, and this bottom one here would need to be empty, and the master MMFS would go there. The Turbo SPI board itself goes into the user port underneath the machine. Now it's a bit of a tight fit, so what's suggested is that you take the SD card out prior to installation. Now the way it goes is the notchy bit needs to be facing into the case here so you should be able to see the guard the card reader from the outside when you flip the machine over so you can see here it's a really tight fit don't know you can't even see because my fat fingers are in the way so just need to make sure it's in firmly yep and when those two plastic wings kick into place that should tell you that it's in about as far as it's going to go. Install the SD card, which is, I always get it around the wrong way, except for that time where I got it around the right way. Happy days. Now we've started up the master and it started in OS 3.2, as we can tell by the way it says Acorn MOS with Acorn in sentence case. We need to see where the ROMs are at. So we can see that the various ROMs we have here are for ADFS, DFS, and Master MMFS Turbo. And Master MMFS Turbo is the one we're going to want. So it's fairly simple to actually change the file system. In fact, I'll show you how. It's star configure file 8. If we break, it might just go back to 1770. If it does, then we'll just have to do a hard reset. Yeah, we'll have to do a hard reset. So now we've done that, we'll just turn that off and on again. There we go, Master MMFS Turbo. Now what you might find is that in some cases it might be showing as unplugged, and if it shows as unplugged, you just need to run the insert command. But for all intents and purposes, we should be good to go. First thing we need to do is we just need to set the driver zero. We want to access disk 300 card hmm what this is telling me is that uh, this can't find the SD card let me make sure that it's seated correctly okay so I've done that off camera hmm now I should point out that uh, the vendor of the Turbo SPI includes a brilliant CD full of all the documentation you could possibly want for the um, MMFS and Turbo SPI setup. And they have a separate file called problems.pdf. So what I might have to do is I might have to look up problems.pdf and work out what this means. Problems. First up, let's see if we can actually get the card showing. That means the card's not bad. That means that the ROM is not bad. The ROM is good. Now let's try accessing the card again. Okay, attempting to access the device gives a card error. 
Here in order of simplicity are some checks to carry out. If supplied, turn the 20-way ribbon cable around so the end that was plugged into the interface is attached to the user port connection and vice versa. Not applicable. Model B owners, not applicable. Suggestion about user VIA being potentially faulty. In the case of the master and model B, the user VIA is usually soldered in place. It could still be faulty, but changing it is clearly much more work. I really don't feel like doing much more work. I've pulled out the Turbo SPI momentarily uh, to allow for the next test. Uh, and this is a simple VIA check, just to make sure that the VIA is doing what it should. And it's the instructions are calling for this to be run without the Turbo SPI in place. And obviously any second processors are turned off now. There's no second processor in here yet. So that's a moot point. Now apparently what this does is that if everything's all clear, it won't produce any output at all, but if there's any issues, it will. So let's see what happens. Ah. Did I actually get that correct? Let's have a look. List. Okay, right. Okay, so that's correct. Hmm. Okay, let me just read what it says here. Ideally, this program should produce absolutely no output at all. What it does is write all possible bit patterns to the VIA data direction register for port B, located at ampersand FE62, and ensure that the same bit pattern can be read back. If the program runs and then just gives a prompt, it doesn't prove that all aspects of the user port are working, but if you get one or more numbers printed out, then there is definitely a problem. Often, the number printed will be seen to be either less or more by a power of 2. For instance, the program might write 100 to the DDRB but read back 36. This is 64 less than expected and suggests that bit 6 is stuck low. Obviously, 2 to the power of 6 being 64. This in turn points to the D6 data pin on the VIA not being properly connected to D6 on the 6502 processor. Perhaps a 6522 via needs its pins cleaned. This here is IC6. IC6, yep, which is a 6522 VIA. That one needs to pop out because that's the chip that controls the user port and that's what I'm having problems with in terms of accessing the SD card. When I hop back to this, there should be a socket in there along with another 6522. Okay, so after nearly three hours of swearing, that's the best I was able to do with that 40 pin dip. The trouble is as well, a desoldering station is good for getting rid of 98% of the solder along with the solder wick. It's just two, that last 2% which can be an absolute prick of a thing to just get through. So it's it looks shit here and it looks even more shit on the back. In fact, so much so that I lifted a couple of traces or little indie bits. So I've had to bodge a couple of wires in there. I hope it's going to work. If it doesn't, well, I'm not going to make another video about it because I'm kind of over it. All things being equal, I should now be able to access my Turbo SPI. So drive zero. I'm going to look at disk 300. And catalog. It actually effing worked. I can't believe it. That is, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm shocked. I'm glad that's over with. Let's put it that way. Whilst I've already demonstrated that IC6 is now playing ball with a Turbo SPI, I'll just run that test program again for the sake of completeness. There we have it. No numbers, no problems. I had better do that color composite mod before I change my mind and just button this up. But, um, or I could just pull my finger out and get an RGB monitor or get my 1081 fixed and go from there. But um, yeah. The colour composite mod on 
and issue one BBC Master 128 is really straightforward. Just need to solder one of these little guys here, a 470 Pico Farad ceramic cap between the emitter on Q12 and the center pin on Q13, a couple of transistors. I've already marked the required pins with a black Sharpie. So the plan is to just get this little guy in there in between those places, make sure there's no issues with uh, shorts or whatever and uh, go from there. Yep, going into shaky cam mode again. Um, emitter of uh, Q12, center of Q13. That should work, but I guess I won't know until I put some power onto it and plug it into the screen. So just firing this up right now won't tell me that much until I do a bit more with it, mainly because The CMOS was unplugged, the CMOS battery was unplugged rather, therefore I have to go through all the faffing about that I mentioned in a previous episode to get this properly configured. I'll rejoin you shortly once I've done that bit, but in the meantime if you're curious about how I would do it and how I've done it in the past, check the top right hand corner. Okay, a quick colour test, let's just flick over to mode 2. Hey, etc. You kind of get the gist of what I'm doing here. As you would have seen just before, works fantastic on the 40 column modes and many of the graphics modes. Not so great when using 80 column mode. Not really planning on doing a lot of 80 column mode stuff with this particular machine. Gets to the point where I do want to start doing 80 column mode stuff. I can just wire a switch in there. I might have to change the capacitor so I've got a bit longer lead where the switch might go, whether it's internal, external, I don't know, but right now, that's a result. See you later.